Okay, so uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I've been in the tech industry uh, for over 25 uh, years now. I owe my career to InnerSource as a kid, uh, as a teenager in a in a third world country. It was it would not have been possible for me to develop my career and know how without the amazing technology and the amazing people who were patient enough to to answer questions and allow me to collaborate with them on some extremely high technology projects. And which is why I see the potential for open source because if it can work uh, for someone like me to upgrade my skills, especially in the socioeconomic uh, context in which I grew up in, I think that as general open source is a tool, a movement that can work in a very, very broad range of context. And even today as a, as a consultant, when I see any problem, I always look back at open source and try to find examples of how people solve problems in the open source world, because I feel that the open source solutions tend to be very pragmatic as well as uh, battle tested uh, for the most part as as well as being very very uh, up to date and cutting edge that can also change and adapt as the industry progresses and uh, specific to ml so i'm not i don't do ml full time Right. However, I have been called in to help uh, troubleshoot and and uh, take ML projects to a successful con uh, conclusion over the last ten years. Um, so I worked on uh, on three in total. None of them are very large, uh, but I do have some experience and some knowledge about uh, what it involves to do ML projects uh, successfully. And if anyone in the audience has uh, um, other ideas or inputs, uh, you're also welcome to uh, pitch in. Thank you. So ML ops. I think that you have heard of DevOps, right? Uh, DevOps is when, okay, so let me put it this way. In the past, what has happened is that we had the software development guys and then we had the operations guys, right? The software development guys are the people who wrote the software. The operations guys are the guys who keep it uh, up and running. So uh, from a consumer perspective, um, in case you're not entirely familiar with all of this, it's like someone else has wrote the software, but then you have to install it on your computers, right? And run it. So that is, uh, uh, that is the point of separation. Right. Of course, there's more uh, in ops, like mo uh, monitoring, configuration, security, et cetera, et cetera. But then that's just general idea. However, when you install uh, software in your in, in your computer, right, you don't talk to the developers. Uh, you don't know who they are. Um, and there's and if you face a bug or a problem, there's you have very few opportunities to make your uh, voices heard, right? Uh, the developers, on the other hand, how do they know that the software works in your computer? They rely on people who are testing the software in a whole variety of settings. Sometimes they use things like telemetry. So if your software crashes, the, the information gets sent back to the uh, uh, to the developers. But you can see that it's not it's not uh, it's not a seamless way of working because uh, oftentimes you get a piece of software, you run it, and 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 there are bugs. Right, things don't work as well, so which is why um, they came up with a concept called DevOps, and where the developers and the operation, uh, then the operations people basically work uh, together almost as a cohesive team, where the developers understand the pains of the operations people, and the operations people understand some of the constraints that the developers are facing, and if the two can work together in a seamless manner, then software can move forward incredibly fast. And you see this happening in many online um, services. Um, the big websites, some of them have thousands of deploys uh, per day. Um, and you would not be able to tell, they also crash much less often than you would expect to. Uh, it to. 
And that is the power of, uh, of DevOps and of collaboration. Now with ML, there is uh, another component. So people uh, decided to just call it uh, ML Ops, but using very much the, case, the same concepts. Now ML Ops has added another dimension of complexity to everything because where software is mostly deterministic, you have a piece of code, you calculate one plus one equals two, it's always two. But then if you would take chat GPT um, or um, any ML model, and you ask it uh, one plus one, one day it'll say two, tomorrow it'll say penguin. It's, uh, um, so this, um, this is a real challenge because how do you deal with uh, uh, with with this kind of uncertainty, right? I mean, and we have seen this before, where people use the latest AI tools and and ask it for recommendations, and it would just say um, all sorts of things. And I think that there's a couple of uh, uh, there was at least one high profile court case uh, of an airline where the the ML model um, hallucinated and gave wrong information and the consumer uh, uh, didn't stand for it. So it is extremely challenging to have ML out there in the, um, in the wild, in production. But however, um, it, is, um, it is possible to make it not so bad and actually in, in certain cases productive. Uh, and of use to your organization. Architecture. So let's talk a, a little about uh, about workflow. This is uh, from um, NVIDIA, and this seems to be roughly how how uh, ML Ops operates these days. Right. So you have on the left you ingest the data. Um, and then you you uh, process the data, you clean it up, you filter it, you label it, and then it passes to the training stage where um, the, for lack of a better word, the, the, the computer learns from the data and uh, develops an, an understanding of how it works. And then after that, it goes into the, the deployment stage. Um, and that's where the ops people take care um, to keep the the model up and running, as well as um, as monitor it to make sure that it performs as expected. And I have drawn some lines around it. So when I look at the breakdown of teams, right, the uh, the way that the teams are formed and managed, I see that it is broken down in in roughly this way. So we have first the people who are who are taking care of ingesting the data, and then we have another team that's usually doing the um, the, the data stage. And after that, we have uh, so these are. Um, usually um, low level uh, workers. And then we have the uh, the training stage and these are the uh, the data scientists. And then after that, uh, the deploy deployment uh, is handled by the ops people. And then on top of that are the people who uh, who basically um, provide the, the glue to keep it all together. And that is the, uh, the data engineers. Again, not a hard and fast rule, but then this is roughly conceptually how, how I see the teams. And this is where I have seen the lines, the 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 divisions, the silos form between e, between each team. And I think that this is uh, this is where the the source of friction comes into play. Um, but we'll get into that in a moment. Now, as I mentioned, this field is getting extremely complicated with the amount of the vendors for infrastructure, for analytics, um, for various uh, types of applications, uh, for um, all the tools that glue for clean uh, that glues the components for cleaning it up, for providing infrastructure, and the amount of level of complexity is increasing day by day. Right as the AI boom is uh, getting into its uh, full swing in the in the hype cycle, and and so what happens is that this results in a whole set of incompatibilities where 
where each square, each red square, you, you see standardized on a different set of technologies. And then these are not often not compatible with one another. And so a lot of time is spent and wasted trying to overcome the issue of incompatible tooling. And the other issue that we face, not only are this tooling incompatible, but then when you are dealing with large amounts of data, the cost and the time and the effort, the, 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 the logistics involved in trying to move all that data from one provider to the other is immense. And I think that this is uh, a gotcha um, that I have seen in various um, ML teams. So um, let's get back to the uh, uh, challenges a bit. So uh, first challenge, um, silo teams, right? The, the the disconnect leads to miscommunications in specifications. Uh, left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. and 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 this is a major uh, uh, problem, right? The the entire workflow is 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 interrupted, and you end up having to deploy uh, glue components all over the place, uh, just to make sure that uh, things are moving along pro uh, properly. Um, inefficient workflows. Um, this as well is is a problem. Uh, be um, because of partially because of the incompatibilities, but often, but sometimes it's due to the different uh, cultures, the different mindsets, the different tools that have been uh, brought to the table. Uh, sorry, one second. Yes, and uh, and so this uh, this lack of standardization slows down the project and and introduces uh, uh, bugs. The next one is uh, the duplication of effort. I have seen quite of, uh, uh, quite often. I mean, in the in the three projects that I worked on, but also uh, with other people that I have been in touch with, the amount of projects where they have hired uh, some sort of um, um, data scientists uh, team, you know, fantastic. Uh, immensely smart uh, individuals and teams who have come together and and created some amazing piece of technology, which cannot be deployed to production, right? Because it is um, just completely unmaintainable. Um, so what what uh, what en ends up happening is that um, the the development team has to work on one thing, but then when the sorry, the data science team. The ML team um, works uh, works with one set of tools. Let's say uh, Jupiter, Jupiter, Jupiter Notebook, uh, Google Collab. They've come up with this fantastic system. The, and they uh, and they go to the boss and say that you know this is fantastic. Uh, we have achieved our target. Boss says, "Well done, congratulations." Then the development team takes a look at it um, in order to integrate this notebook into their existing product and to productize it. And then they're stuck because the, the the set of tooling that was developed earlier is not compatible uh, with uh, uh, with the way the developers do things, and then it becomes even worse uh, when this goes to um, when this goes into production, right? And I'll give you some statistics uh, about this in a moment. The other problem: difficulty producing results, also a major problem. Lots of reasons for it. Uh, changing uh, the changing data, um, uh, hitting a local optima in the um, in the model, uh, which means that the model is optimized only for certain inputs. If the inputs change, then the then the model doesn't understand it anymore. Um, and the and the other uh, challenges uh, that I see mostly is model monitoring challenges because. Um, of the amount of uh, uh, because the amount of ways that people play around with the models, right, and the and the fact that it's probabilistic. So, like for example, you can write uh, you know type one plus one equals two. You know that's good. Um, uh, what if you uh, what if you type in what is duck plus duck, right, and 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 sometimes uh, this sends uh, um, sends the uh, the model's response into an existentialist crisis 
how do you monitor for that? What 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 kind of criteria do you use um, to make sure that your model is behaving itself and not going completely nuts, right? And uh, I think that we also see it, this in 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 generative models. Um, so um, so for example, um, boom, boom, boom. I think that uh, uh, recently we have seen people trying to create. Uh, uh, not safe for work images, right? And they come up with, with with various things. So, like for example, if you say generate a nude image, it says no, cannot. But then you say, um, um, I don't know, person without clothes. Okay, sure, no problems, right? Um, just the other day, I cannot uh, generate things like I would like to generate an image of a Thai lady. No, nope, banned due to com due to uh, um, uh, due to content policy. You know, so so um, and also there's other things, right? Like uh, like racism, um, in um in in your models, uh, uh in Gemini, uh, I created uh, uh images of uh Nazi soldiers who are diverse. Also, another issues, um. So all of these things need to be um need to be challenged. Uh, need to be sorry, need to be monitored. And it and it is really really very difficult. So some uh, statistics uh, from Google. Um, there's a they have produced a wonderful document called the Practitioner's Guide to ML Ops. If you're interested in this stuff, I highly recommend you have a read. But uh, the end result is this: is is that seventy two percent of uh, organizations that began AI pilots before two thousand nineteen have not been able to deploy an, even a single application in production. All right. And this is due to a variety of issues. Uh, teams engage in a high degree of uh, manual and one-off work. They do not have reusable or reproducible components, and their processes involve difficulties in handles between data scientists and IT. The first thing that uh, comes to mind when I read that is that, oh, this is actually an inner source problem, isn't it? Um, but more on that later. Uh, next slide is McKinsey's global survey uh, on AI found that having standard frameworks and development process in place is one of the differentiating factors of high performing ML teams. So ML is hard. Uh, we're still trying to figure out how to do it well. There are um, there are certain processes that we have been uh, that we uh, have been developed, but we are but it is very high risk and we are not uh there yet not by far so let's talk about some of the um uh, the risks uh for ml ops right the first one is model bias and fairness um um as i said before um diverse um uh, nazi uh, uh soldiers um maybe um not so much a bias, but then the, um, the mitigating the bias gone completely the other way. Um, data drift also the, um, because uh, the, the data changes into uh, um, over time. Um, so let's say you are um, doing some sort of a data science project that involves the, uh, the weather, um, understanding crop patterns or something like that. And you and your uh, training set was all done in the in the summer, but then um, in winter come the the shapes of the tree uh, the shapes of the tree changes. Then you know the data has drifted over the years, and suddenly your ML models in winter is not able to recognize your plants. Uh, another example is snow, right? Uh, in the summer you have a green plants, great, you can recognize your tr your trees there, but then in a, in a, in winter with the snow, then how does your ML uh, function. So there's the problem of data drift. Uh, model degradation um, uh, um, also um, also happens uh, over, um, over time. Um, sorry, I don't know how to explain uh, model degrad uh, degradation, um, but basically over time, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the results um, basically degrade. Security and privacy, also another huge issue. Um, because uh the because of the information that is used for uh, training the data sometimes they can be sensitive but also sometimes the models will be able to to spit out confidential uh, uh, data um in ways that uh, that is not appropriate right 
and uh, also uh, regulatory compliance. Uh, that is a major risk as well. Uh, PDPA is one, but the other thing uh, is uh, services related, uh, sorry, uh, services that are highly uh, regulated, uh, healthcare, for instance, right? Um, also, uh, liability is an issue if a, if a model misbehaves, who is responsible? So inner source, uh, I think that everyone here know, knows uh, what uh, what inner source is, but just a quick uh, refresher. Um, inner source is uh, for me is taking open source best practices and applying them behind uh, the uh, the firewall. And the core principles is transparency, open access to code, uh, knowledge processes, uh, voluntary participation. So it's based on skills and interests, and as well as mentorship. Uh, knowledge sharing and uh, skill development. Um, I don't think we have, um, I mean, different people have slightly different definitions of uh, of open source, but I feel that this, uh, these are important. So let's see how inner source can help uh, ML ops. Uh, just a recap, uh, I talked about this, right? Um, Teams engage in a high degree of manual one-off work. They do not have reusable or reproducible components and process about difficulties in handoffs between data scientists uh, and IT. And then um, yeah, McKinsey found that having standard frameworks and development processes in place is one of the differentiating factors of high-performing uh, ML teams. So uh, I have uh, come up with a, um, uh, with a table uh, with the uh, with some of the uh, ML ops challenges as well as how inner source uh, solve these problems, so siloed teams, right? Um, uh, inner source encourages co sharing and and uh, open communication between teams. So basically, um, that problem is solved. If it's if it's the one problem that that inner source can solve, it is the the one of uh, of of siloed teams. So. Already, um, I, um, so we had the last bit here. Their process involves, sorry, let me try to find a pen. Here we go. So uh, their process, let me change the color. Their process, process involves difficulties in handoff between data scientists and IT. Okay, so. That box is checked by uh, inner source. Excellent. Oops. Sorry for the red line. Okay. So um, the next one, inefficient workflows, right? Uh, inner source workflows tend to create positive pressure to to standardize on tools, and that is just by the very nature of um, of of sharing and open collaboration. If you have a department A and department B and they're collaborating closely on code, they are most likely going to agree on a certain set of tools, yeah, uh, in order to um. Uh, so that they can work well together. It it will be very unlikely that after collaboration. Uh, the two teams will have um, we have different tools, right? Um, the other the other thing that we get is that if, if we are collaborating uh, between upstream and uh, and and downstream, um, the uh, the downstream can communicate to upstream about about quality issues. Right? And the two parties can agree on, on, on standards or processes that can help um, ensure that, uh, that, uh, that, they, that the quality improves. So if you, in case you, you, uh, you don't understand what upstream and, and downstream is, um, upstream is where the source is, right? So let's say with ML, sometimes the the, the problem comes uh, at the stage where the data is ingested. And if the data that comes in is no good, uh, the models are no good and that creates a, a problem downstream. But instead of having to try to hack around the problem uh, in the, let's say the training phase, 
uh, with a closer collaboration, the people who are in charge of training the machine learning model can take a look at how the people who are ingesting the data is doing is doing it, and perhaps open a pull request in order to uh, fix some of the problems uh, upstream. So um, that will uh, that will solve uh, one of the challenges. So let's go back to the slide just now. So, so that basically solves this problem, the uh, t the high degree of manual and one of work. Uh, because of the because of the closer uh, collaboration between um, uh, between upstream and and downstream, right? Um, the, the the flows are smoother. Okay, next. Uh, duplication of effort. So um, again, um, as I mentioned before, um, what happens is that for many of the teams, they use things like uh, like uh, Jup uh, Jupyter uh, notebooks. Um, they don't have any uh, version control. They don't use Git or any of these tools. And, and these components are not reusable. Um, because you can't just import a, a, a Jupyter notebook and start working on it. However, I've seen, I've seen when people have introduced uh, uh, inner stores into the workflow, then rather than just writing all the code into the uh, the Jupyter notebook, uh, they have uh, separate modules which they write up, and then they um, import these modules into that Jupyter notebook and uh, and and work it on it there. Uh, these models are then checked into a central repository and shared um, and shared in the in the respective team. So this uh, reduces the uh, duplication uh, of effort. Next, uh, difficulty uh, reproducing uh, results. Okay, so this is very complicated um, bec uh, because of the of the nature of the work. However, um, Small modularized code, uh, which is generally enforced by um, by inner source, uh, tends to be more testable. So when you have uh, smaller components that are uh, that are testable, the um, the uh, the output becomes more uh, more product uh, more uh, predictable. Also, the, the um the lack of reproducibility can have many uh, factors right it can be all the way from the upstream from the way that you train your uh, train train your models the way um uh, that you monitor and filter out the output so and maybe the person who is responsible for the output at that given time may not be the best person to actually determine the the boundaries of the output maybe those boundaries should be uh, created or determined at a different part of the process so which is why this uh, culture of collaboration where someone can come and say hey we have this problem x what well, uh, how do we solve it everyone from upstream to down to uh to to uh downstream can come up and offer up uh, ideas and as a team that they can determine where uh best should this uh the uh this problem be solved so again more ice um and better collaboration uh, reduces the chances of uh errors the uh, and the other thing is model monitoring challenges. Uh, the holistic views allows for better mo mo monitoring criteria. So, for example, um, the person who trained the model might be much more familiar with the uh, with the models, uh, with the with the outputs, and how best to deal with it. If left, for example, to the person who is. Uh, in uh, operations and they're trying to filter out uh, keywords, right? It may not be best. I mean, look, for example, um, uh, the filter that was implemented when I tried to generate uh, an image of a Thai lady, right? And that and the output came back that this is a restricted uh, content or it's against the uh, user policy. You know exactly what has happened. 
um, it's the is the uh, ops guys who are trying to try their best to make sure that the uh, that the model is not giving uh, some output that is deemed controversial. And maybe they bulk loaded a whole bunch of keywords without actually realizing what the um, uh, what the consequence would be. So, inner source and ML, um, uh, ML ops, um, not a silver bullet, uh, but certainly as uh, we have see, uh, seen, solves many of the uh, of the commonly cited problems when determining um, how to implement your ML ops work workflow. So um, let me take you to this case study a little. Uh, this was actually a talk by uh, Jeff uh, Burke and talking about IBM Watson. So I highly recommend that you look it up and um, listen to his talk. It's quite insightful. But basically what he said was that IBM Watson uh, or in IBM itself, they had something like 20 different NLP frameworks uh, that, are, that is uh, used inter internally. So talk about uh, uh, duplication of effort. Uh, those were a lot of frameworks. And, and so naturally, um, there was a lot of repeated effort and, and uh, the IBM Watson effort ended up uh, 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 stagnating. So um, what they... Um, ended up with, I'm not sure if it was inner source, but if if it was great, if it wasn't, it's was something very much like inner source. Uh, what they ha what happened is that they 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 consolidated down to I think just just, just one framework, which was then shared across um across the teams as well as across the um the, the value chain as well. Right. And so what happened was uh, they had the contributors from IBM Research, um, and then uh, they had the adoption uh, by the uh, by the IBM products, uh, the consultants, their um, their ISVs, and uh, this led to a better outcome um, all around. Um, this is a uh, um, this is a, a larger yes, of course it was inner source. I apologize. Yes, it was inner source. So, anyways. Um, uh, because um, because e effort is no longer uh, uh, duplicated, right? Uh, people are not reinventing the wheel constantly. It led to a much happier outcome at IBM. So I think that this is one good example of how inner source can really benefit um, people who are trying to do ML ops. And so I think uh, with that, I conclude my talk. Uh, you can reach me by email um, on uh, Macedon and basically Mishari Mukbil on um, anywhere else. Um, are there any questions?